Take your Bible tonight and open up with me to the book of Nehemiah chapter 9 as we continue there. Uh, We continue looking at what has been called the longest prayer in the Old Testament. Perhaps you say, well, I don't know if it's the longest prayer, but it's certainly been the longest explanation. I admit, we are hitting this hard and thorough, looking at all the different uh, teachings that you find in this prayer. There's just so much uh, that you can learn from this prayer and the things that uh, Israel has been through. It, it, folks, do you realize that the Bible is so timeless? The things that we are reading about that take place back here in Nehemiah are things that are going on today. The people are different, the place is different, the geography is different, but the situations are essentially the same. And we recognize that as we read through this prayer, we recognize or should recognize ourselves in this and the things that are necessary for our life to be what it ought to be. We spent two weeks looking at the radiance of God. We need to be absolutely fully captivated with who God is, because once we are, then it puts a better perspective on who we are, and it changes how we approach God. It changes how we live our life. Tying this in with what we're seeing on uh, Sunday mornings in 1 John and what we are going to be looking at this coming Sunday, Uh, when we see God the way we ought to see God as a Christian It is going to affect, it's going to impact every single area of our life. It's going to affect our our attitudes, our actions, our language, our our desires, our places we would go for entertainment and things like that. It's going to affect everything when we capture in our heart and our mind the radiance of God, when we get a picture of who God is. Uh, That leads us into worship. Now, it's odd to, to read this prayer because After looking at the radiance of God, and it's a wonderful thing to look at, the next thing that we look at, and if you're keeping notes, this would be Roman number number two, we look at the rebellion of His people. The radiance of God. The radiance of God happened before the people were ever even created. So the radiance of God always comes first, but then the rebellion of the people. And when we read this, it is absolutely crazy that this happened, but even crazier that we have the examples and we still do the exact same things. In Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 16, Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 16, the Bible says, But they and our fathers dealt proudly and hardened their necks and hearkened not to thy commandments. And then it says, And refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage. Stop with that. The rebellion of his people. The rebellion is seen in many ways. First of all, the Bible tells us that they refuse to obey God. Refusing to obey is a defiant act of the will. There's no other way you can look at it. It's a defiant act of the will. It followed the pride. There was a willful hardening of the neck. There was a refusal to listen. You ever seen a kid? They'll go, no, 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 I'm not listening, I'm not listening. That's kind of what Israel is doing. They have refused to obey. It's kind of, kind of, you could describe it like this little kid, he gets in trouble, and mama sets him in a corner, and she says, you sit in that chair until I tell you it's time to get up. And he plunks down that chair, and he says, I'm sitting on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside. That is exactly what Israel is doing. They are sitting or doing what God has told them to do, but they're saying, this is what I'm doing. I am rebelling against you. This is how defiant they were, and this is absolutely dangerous, a dangerous position to be in. When we rebel against God, just go back in your Bibles, not literally, in your mind, go back in your Bibles to the book of Jonah. Jonah is one of God's prophets. God gives Jonah very simple instructions, go to Nineveh, and he says, not going to do it. He hops a ship, he goes the opposite direction to Tarshish. God says, where did Jonah go? I lost him, right? Oh, no. God knew exactly where Jonah was at. He knew where his rebellious child was at. Knew exactly how to find him. Remember how we get into into Jonah chapters 1? At the end of Jonah chapter 1, there's a a storm that comes in, and the ship is, is getting rocked all over the place. He's sound asleep. You know what, Christians, many times we think, oh, you can only sleep if you have a clear conscience. Whoever told you that doesn't know their head from a hole in the ground. 
People can sleep with a very unclear conscience. Jonah's conscience was not clear by any stretch of the imagination. And he's sound asleep. And he gets woke up. He knows what's going on, doesn't he? He says, okay, guys, you're going to have to throw me overboard. They cared so much about him, they tried to find every other way possible to keep throwing him overboard. Finally, they had no choice. Out you go, Jonah. Kersplush. And the Lord provides this great big whale. You know, we've got our, our lunch. I don't know. Jonah to the whale probably looked like a sardine. And he's done. In he goes. And all that time in the belly of the whale and the little conversation that Jonah has with God and God has with Jonah and God gets a hold of him. So Jonah chapter 3, he finally gets out there, preaches the message. What do you know? Those Ninevites, they repented. This great evangelistic uh, crusade takes place and they repented. And Jonah was so happy, wasn't he? (laughs) Jonah chapter 4, he's mad at God. I just knew you'd do that. I just knew you'd forgive those people and save their souls. He's upset about it. Boy, I'll tell you what, Christians, it is a dangerous place for you and I to get into when we are rebelling against our Heavenly Father because He knows right where we're at and He knows exactly how to get us. I was always told when I was a kid, Dad was chairman of the ushers. Old folks, you remember that. But you don't remember it when I was a little kid. And Dad was in one of those little itty-bitty... Uh, usher pews at the back of the service and there was no messing around in church and I remember one time for some reason I decided to get a little antsy and I happened to glance back at my dad (laughs) that was the last time I got antsy I mean I knew exactly what that look meant I was like how'd dad know It was like on the opposite. He was over here and I was over here. He must have heard the rustling. He knew what was going on. Our Heavenly Father knows when we misbehave, Christian. And He is going to do whatever it takes to get us back in line. But do you realize that this is even more dangerous for the lost person that rebels against God? As God is trying to call that lost soul to repentance and to salvation, and they reject Him and they turn their backs against Him, It is a dangerous place to be. And if you're here tonight and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior and the Holy Spirit of God has been dealing with you, He has been dealing with you since you walked in the doors tonight, He is dealing with you right now and you're resisting and you're fighting. Let me tell you something, you are putting yourself in a dangerous position when you resist against the Holy Spirit of God. Go with me, if you will, back to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4. Back to 1 Timothy chapter 4. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, the first two verses, the Bible says, The Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That's a dangerous place to be, where your conscience gets seared. If you've ever gotten burned, and I mean burned good, and you've got a welt and a scar from that, if you keep burning that and that scar begins to grow, you lose feeling in that area. And the person whose conscience has been seared with a hot iron begins to lose feeling, spiritual feeling. Go with me to the book of Romans chapter 2. Back to the book of Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, the first five verses, and this is obviously talking to a lost individual. Romans chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever art thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doeth the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of His goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself 
wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. You keep telling the Lord no. Keep refusing to obey His call to salvation. You have put yourself in a dangerous position. Because the time very well may come where the Spirit of God no longer calls, the conscience is seared, you have kept compiling wrath upon wrath upon wrath that's adding up against you. Yes, God is merciful. Oh, there's no doubt about that. God is so patient and long-suffering, the Bible says. In fact, the Bible says He is so long-suffering that He is not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. But there is a time where the long-suffering and the grace and the mercy of God runs out. And there is no longer an opportunity to be saved. When that time comes, there's no help in you. The rebellion. Number two, they rejected the evidence. Not only did they refuse to obey, they rejected the evidence. Back to Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 17. In the middle of verse 17, Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 17, they refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them. Multiple times the psalmist points to this. Listen to these psalms. Psalm 78, 10. They kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in His law and forgot His works and His wonders that He had showed them. Psalm 78, verses 41 to 43. Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They remembered not His hand nor the day when He delivered them from the enemy. How He had wrought His signs in Egypt and His wonders in the field of Zoan. Psalm 106, we have sinned with our fathers, we have committed iniquity, we have done wickedly. Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. After all the things the Israelites had seen God do, they still refused to obey him. And they rejected the evidence of the things they had seen God do. You know, it's easy to get down on Israel. God has done so much for you, Israel. How in the world could you possibly ignore it? How could you forget it? But are we any different than them? How many times has God blessed, provided, guided, protected, met the needs that we have? How many times? And something just falls apart in our life. The worst possible thing that could happen happens in our brain. And we say, God, how could you? Why would you let me down? Why would you not care? Why would you let go of me? And we begin to accuse God and we begin to do exactly what Israel did. We forget all of his wonderful works. And we choose we choose to go down this road rejecting the evidence and complain, God hasn't done anything for me. Why hasn't God done anything for me? I just heard somebody say that within the last couple of days. Why has God not done anything for us? Easy to get to that point, isn't it? I don't look at the individual that said that and look down at them. I, I really don't. Because if we were all honest, there's been some point in our life or maybe we didn't vocalize it, but we felt it deep down. God, how could you? We expect, God, I expected better out of you. I've served you. I've tried to be faithful. I've tried this. I've tried that. I've done my best, Lord. How could you? Now, I know some of us, I mean, we're just so, so super spiritual, squeaky clean that we just can't imagine. So I take you to Psalm 73. Again, go there mentally. Jot it down. Read it sometime. I've said before, Psalm 73 is one of my favorite psalms. Psalm 73 is the psalm of Asaph, and Asaph spends about 16 or 17 verses essentially saying, God, how could you? I have, I have kept myself clean. I have walked with you. I've done all these things, Lord. And look at how the heathen prosper. Look at how good they've got it. They're not hurting. They're not struggling. Seems like everything that they do wrong, it gets blessed. And it turns out just, you know, like the Midas touch. And Asaph was upset. 
Do you remember what changed his mind? It was when he walked into the sanctuary of God. When he walked into the dwelling place of God and got his perspective right. And he saw their end. We judge everything by the present, don't we? But as we look at Israel, Israel doesn't do anything any different than we do. We oftentimes reject the evidence that's blatantly clear that God gives us. Here's the third thing. Next part of verse 17 of Nehemiah chapter 9. It says, in their rebellion, they appointed a captain to return to their bondage. So that's your third thing tonight. They returned to their bondage. Let's follow the progression if we could. Go back with me to the book of Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14, and we go to the place where uh, the Israelites have already gotten out of Egypt, but the Pharaoh is chasing them. And in Exodus chapter 14, starting in verse 10, when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to have served the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still. And see the salvation of the Lord. And he will show you today for the Egyptians whom ye have seen today. Ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you. And ye shall hold your peace. At the end of the chapter, we get to read about how the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. And how the Pharaoh and his army are drowned in the Red Sea. We get to chapter 15. And I've got a heading across mine that says, The Song of Moses. It starts out with praise and, and worship because of all that had taken place. By the time you get into the middle of chapter 15, we read that the time of celebration has changed because the people now, I mean, almost instantly are complaining, we're thirsty. We just passed through the Red Sea, we just see this miracle, and we have given the Lord praise and it's made us thirsty. We got no water. And so there's a miracle as to how the water is taken care of. Then we get to chapter 16. And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month, after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The children of Israel said unto them, Would to God that we had died at the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this assembly, this whole assembly with hunger. That's a whining bunch of people, isn't it? And it doesn't stop there. Go to Numbers. Now remember, we're following a progression. They wanted to return to their bondage. It says in Numbers chapter 14. And by the way, in the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, this is book number four. They started whining in book number two. They're still whining. We get to chapter 14, verse 1, and the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. The people wept that night, and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God that we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Does the scripture record that Israel actually appointed a captain and actually returned? Now, unless I miss something, and I did a bunch of studying from different commentaries and things like that, I can't find any place in Scripture where they did. They threatened it here, but they didn't do it. But when we get to the book of Nehemiah, 
the Bible says that they did it. Uh-oh, an error in the Bible, right? So how do we explain it? You've got to go to the New Testament to get your explanation. Go with me to the book of Acts chapter 7. Again, I tell you, this is where studying your Bible is just so much fun. You find things, and God has these little nuggets just hidden all over the place. And they're really not hidden that deep. You know, you, I don't know if they still do that geocaching thing. And I've heard people talk about, oh, boy, they just love going and doing that. I'm thinking, why? It's just a glorified scavenger hunt. And when you're done, what do you got? You found something. Big deal. I don't want to waste my time with that. But boy, I sure like hunting stuff out of the Bible, and it's easy to find. Acts 7, verse 39. Acts 7, verse 39. To whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again unto Egypt. Where did the sin take place? Hampened in their hearts. I think they probably did have somebody picked out that they were going to call the captain that was going to lead them. Probably the one that was griping the most. You know, that'd be the great one to get. The one that's grumbling the most, yeah, let's let that person lead us back. But we don't see anything in Scripture where they actually put it, the plan into action and went. And yet God says you're guilty of going. Even though you didn't point your compass in that direction, you didn't hitch up your chariot and your wagons and take all your possessions and go, in your heart, you did. Do we not see how important that is? The sin that is committed. The sin is not in the execution of the plan. It's in the contemplation of the plan. And we think, well, so long as I don't actually do it. Boy, I thought about it. Boy, I gave it a lot of thought. But I didn't do it. So I'm free and clear. And God says, no, you're not. Because you did it in your heart. It was already as if it had been done. Because it was done in their hearts. And that's how God saw them. By law, a thief is a thief after they have stolen something. But if you walk into Walmart after church and you're walking up and down the aisles and you're thinking, you know, I, could, I bet I could pocket a few things here. Nobody would ever notice. You know, you could walk out. Them, those silly machines, they beep about anything. You know, and it used to really bother me anymore. It's like, just walk through it. Oh, but it's going off. Please will come and get you. I don't know. My wife, it would go off on her purse. Don't know why. And it, honestly, there's nothing in it, trust me. She didn't take nothing. And I would ask her, I says, what is setting that thing off? She says, it's, it's got to be the purse. It's the only thing that could set it off. Who knows? Finally, I just said, I'm just walking. If they want me, I'm out there. I am not going to go hunt somebody down and say, all right, frisk me, check all my bags and all this kind of stuff. Forget it. I know I didn't take anything. So I'm free and clear. But you say, oh, but I thought about it. But the law says we can't arrest you because you thought about something. And God says, well, in fact, let's look at Proverbs 24 and verse 9. Proverbs 24, verse 9. In Proverbs 24 and verse 9, the Bible says, the thought of foolishness is sin. And the scorner is an abomination to men. The thought of foolishness doesn't say the action of foolishness. The thought of foolishness. We looked at this on Sunday. What is sin? What's the definition? First John gives us sin is the transgression of God's law. And if I think about how to transgress God's law, it is foolishness, it is a sin, and I am not guilty because I did something. I am guilty because I thought about doing it. Isn't that important? I mean, isn't that so important, Christians? Because our mind, we have got to guard our mind, our thoughts. 
That's why in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the Bible tells us to bring every thought captive to the Lord. If we're not thinking it, we're not going to do it. But it always starts here. It starts here. Before it ever happens here. So if we get it out of here and get it out of here, it ain't going to happen here. And I'm not guilty before God of having contemplated the sin. Do we not see how important it is, Christian, to have our thought life right? Because God holds us accountable for it. In Psalm 66 and verse 18, if I regard iniquity of my heart, if I regard to look at, to gaze at, to perceive, to consider, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now Moses has been leading the people for a very long time. And boy, they sure have thought about doing a lot of things. And they've even voiced it. And even though they didn't actually do it, they were still guilty as if they had. There's a time where God comes to Moses and says, you know what? I'm just going to obliterate them all. Let's start over. If you were Moses, would you have taken God up on that offer? (laughs) But if you'd started, if anything, I would have said, God, go ahead and obliterate them, but I do not want to start over because I'm too old. Moses was not a young guy. I don't want to go through this again, Lord. You know, if you want to get rid of them all, okay. Okay. That's your God. I'm not going to argue with you about it. Is that what he did? Go back to Nehemiah chapter 9. Look with me at verse 17. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 17. After they had the rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage, but thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and forsookest them not. As we look at this portion of the prayer, the rebellion of the people, there are going to be, and I really anticipated getting through this tonight. I'm not going to make it. It's like, wow. When you look at the prayer, the Lord says, Israel did this, Israel did this, Israel did this. Moses, how about I destroy them? And this is where mercy intervenes. And that is the coolest thing about the rebellion of the people. There's mercy. Where sin doth abound, Romans says, grace doth much more abound. And do we not see that spelled out with Israel? Go back with me to Numbers chapter 14, where we were at just a minute ago. Numbers chapter 14. Mercy intervenes. God is more than happy to get them out of Moses' hair, if Moses had any hair left. Numbers 14, verse 17. And Moses is interceding for the people. He says, And now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people, according unto the greatness of thy mercy, and as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt, even until now. Lord, forgive them. That's mercy. Did Israel deserve mercy? Not in the least little bit. What they deserved was justice. And God would have been 100% just to have destroyed them. But guess what? How many of us deserve mercy? What did we deserve? We deserve justice. Mercy doesn't give you what you deserve. Mercy gives you what you don't deserve. And it's God's grace. And so God spared the people. 
This is going to be an ongoing thing that we see. Numbers chapter 14, verse 20, the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. I want to go ahead and wrap it up on this point. It's a good point to end with. Think about the people in your life that have done you wrong. Oh, you don't have to think too hard. Don't, hmm, has anybody ever done me wrong? <laughs> Man, you, oh yeah. <laughs> you can make your list really quick, can't you? And what do they deserve? They deserve justice. Right? Go ahead and say it, right? Absolutely, that's what they deserve. What are we supposed to give them, Christian? Grace and mercy. Ephesians 4.32, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That is so simple to preach, so easy. It is so hard to live out, isn't it? There, it is so easy tonight for you to tell the person sitting beside you tonight, you need to be a forgiver. Go ahead and try that. Just look at somebody and say, you need to be a forgiver. <laughs> now, when it comes back and it's told to you, how do you like it? Oh, well, I've got, my circumstances are different. <laughs> eh. You say, well, if I forgive, if I show mercy, if I show grace, that lets them off my hook. Lets them off the hook. Isn't that your hook? It's God's. God will take care of things. You say, well, they need, this needs to happen. That needs to happen. Justice needs to be served. It will be. God will take care of things. But also, God is quick to pardon and to forgive. What every single one of us deserves is hell. Every one of us deserves hell. Why? Because we came into this world a sinner. And the wages of sin is death. And there is none righteous, no, not one. That is what we all deserve is hell. But aren't you thankful tonight that God in His grace and mercy saved your soul? If you're saved, aren't you glad for that? And then tonight you look at a lost soul, and they need to be told about this grace and mercy. Romans goes on to say, even though where sin doth abound, grace doth much more abound, so then, I think it's Romans chapter 6 then says, well then should we sin that grace may abound? What's the answer to that one? God forbid. We don't receive God's grace and mercy so that we can sin more, but rather it breaks our heart as a Christian that we sin against the one who our sin that deserved punishment in hell was placed upon our Savior on a cross. And the sins that we committed against Christ are far worse than any sin that anybody's ever committed against us. Far worse. And I know, we say, oh, it sure don't feel that way. God the Father has never had to look away from you. And where you've ever had to cry out and say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We've never said those words, and we never will. But Jesus said those words. What must it have felt like to have been forsaken by the Heavenly Father? What must that have felt like? I can't even fathom it. But Jesus hung there for you and I. And spilled his blood willingly so that we could be saved. And he was born, uh, buried in the tomb and he arose from the grave so that we could be made new creatures in Christ Jesus so that we who are dead in trespasses and sins could be made alive in Christ. And for those of us sitting here tonight that know Jesus Christ as Savior, who do we need to show grace and mercy to? And for those of you who don't know Christ as Savior, Christ wants to show that to you tonight. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed this evening.
If you're here without Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you say, I didn't realize God loved me that much. Oh, I haven't even begun, and there is no way I could ever tell you how much God loves you. But I can tell you tonight, He will save your soul. If you're willing to repent and believe the gospel, to call upon Jesus to be saved, He'll save you. If that's where you're at tonight, would you pray something like this, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know that I rightfully deserve hell. But I believe Jesus loves me. That he died for me. That he rose again from the grave. And that if I will call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, I will be. And Lord, that's what I'm doing right now. I ask you to come into my heart and save me. Forgive me, Lord. If that's something you prayed tonight, and I, you sincerely, genuinely meant it, it wasn't just repeating words. You say, I've never prayed anything like that tonight, but I genuinely meant that. Would you just slip your hand up this evening? Then our Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you love us so much. And as we see the rebellion of the people, Lord, we, we are sometimes very rebellious ourselves. And we shouldn't. There's no reason for our rebellion. But we are thankful, Lord, for the grace, the mercy that pardons. And tonight, if there is still one here without Jesus as Savior, before they would leave this place, we pray that they'd get things right in their life with you. For your name's sake and for your honor and glory, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.